I let go of the hammer, bang, the gun goes off. Tonight, the movie star who held that gun. Hollywood star Alec Baldwin. Firing a prop gun. He killed the director of photography, injured the director. Alec Baldwin, speaking exclusively for the first time after that fatal shooting, only to George Stephanopoulos. It's a big question, and the one you must have asked yourself a thousand times. How could this have happened? We have two injuries from the movie gun shot. We need help immediately. The interview, his answers, what everyone's been waiting for. There's only one question to be resolved, only one. That is, where did the live round come from? Do you believe the set was sabotaged? A movie set of a church for a film called Rust, now surrounded by crime scene tape. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. Why did you choose not to check the gun yourself? And what of Helena Hutchins, the woman whose life was taken? She was someone who was uh, uh, loved by everyone who worked with and admired. Now, Alec Baldwin, nothing off limits. You've described it as a one in a trillion shot and the gun was in your hand. Do you feel guilt? Everybody ready? Phones off? Phones are off. Let me get okay. slate. Marker, good. Great. Alec, thank you for doing this. You, you haven't said much in public since that tragic accident. Why, why speak out now? Well, I think that um, there's a criminal investigation. That could be a while. Uh, there's all kinds of civil litigation. And I felt there were a number of misconceptions, most of it from sources I really wouldn't concern myself about but a couple that I did concern myself about where there were these authoritative statements about this is what happened. The Sheriff's Department hasn't even released a report to the DA yet. The reason I wanted to sit down with you is because I really feel like I can't wait for that process to fit to end in February, March. I mean, I'm not asking them to speed it up for my benefit, that's ridiculous. But I am saying that they're gonna do what they need to do and I wanted to come to talk to you to say that well, I would go to any lengths to undo what happened. I would go to any lengths to undo what happened. I think the big question, and the one you must have asked yourself a thousand times, how could this have happened? Well, there's two things I want to say about that. One is that when I talk about this, my concern is that I don't sound like I'm the victim. Because there is a victim. There's a woman who died, and my friend got shot, He's my friend, and she was a new friend. I met her and we worked together on the, some of the mapping out of what we we're going to do on the film, which, you know, in the movie terms, if you go make a movie with Scorsese, you and the DP don't sit down and they solicit your ideas of how to make the film, you know what I mean? In the case of Helena, we sat down collaboratively and talked a lot about what we wanted to do in that uh, a precious amount of time we had. But um, I, I, I want to make sure that I don't come across like I'm the victim because we have two victims here. And the second thing is, is that all of what happened on that day leading up to this event was precipitated on one idea, and that is that Helena and I had something profound in common. And that is we both assumed the gun was empty, other than those, you know, uh, dummy rounds. I want to get into more detail on the day in a minute, but let's take a step back. What was it that drew you to this project in the first place, to Rust? I'd worked on a project with Joel before. Joel Susan, the Susan, director. Right, he, he did this movie, Crown Vic, that I produced. And uh, Joel and I stayed in touch, we're friends, and I loved Rust. He said, he said, I want to send you this. And I read it and I said, I love it, I love it. Rust, a low-budget Western, tells the story of an aging outlaw on the run with his young grandson. Baldwin, the film's star, is also one of the producers. Very excited. Very, very, so excited that we finally got this made because every independent film has many false starts. You know what I mean? And when it finally goes, you finally get, you feel like a plane. When you finally get some lift under your wings, it's very, very gratifying. I am a purely creative producer. My authorities as a producer are casting and script, which are actually married to the role of being a lead actor in a film. So you're not the kind of producer who's looking at the line item of each budget? No, 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 no. no. They're, they're, they're basically two types of producers who are who are really in charge of production people that raise the money and the people who spend the money my consultations or approvals were completely about casting and about the script 
I don't hire anybody in the crew. I don't Not even the cinematographer, no one? No, no, but he will apprise me of what he's doing. And he'll say to me, I got Helena Hutchins to be the DP. I said, oh, how do you feel about that? Are you excited? I'm very excited. She's wonderful. What did you know about Helena Hutchins before she started working on this? I knew nothing about her until Joel said to me, I got her. She was fantastic. Helena Hutchins, the talented cinematographer praised by many in the industry, was a trailblazer in the field historically dominated by men. Make sure we don't see people walking around, like walking around. Ready? Action. The Ukrainian-born cinematographer quickly gelled with Baldwin. The people who watched The Daily said that her work was beautiful. She was someone who was loved by everyone who worked with and liked by everyone who worked with and admired. but admired by everybody who, um, who worked with her. Russ' 21-day production began filming on October 6th at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, just outside Santa Fe, New Mexico. The ranch has long been a favorite location for filming westerns. <laughs> we need a place to lay low. They grab a way of escalating out here in the west with... One thing leading to another. The day that I flew there, they'd been shooting for a week already. I come the following week on the 11th. That night of the 11th, I had dinner with Helena and Joel. And we talked about some of the compositions I was thinking of to... Uh, that was the first time you met? First time I met Helena, yeah. What was your first impression? When I met her, I knew she had that spark. I knew she had that flint to her that she was going to get that day's work done and get the shots that she wanted. She was very focused. She had a vision for she the She was very focused. We had a discussion about compositions of shots in which you were shooting these beautiful tableaus of the West. She had that intensity. Every day you went to work, she would say, good morning, how are you? How was your evening? Boom. It was small talk, go. We weren't going to hang out and, and chit chat or whatever. She knew that the clock was the enemy and we have to move forward. Once on set, Baldwin posts this video. I want to say, I look at myself in the mirror, a reflection of this, and I'm really kind of appalled. It's appalling. Uh, we're here shooting the film. We start tomorrow. And, um, uh, and no, I'm not playing Santa Claus. On the 12th, I had a safety demonstration with Hannah Reed, the armor. 24-year-old Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, seen here in photos by the DailyMail.com, was hired as the film's armorer, in charge of all weapons on set. The daughter of a famous Hollywood armorer, Russ was only her second film in this role. She spoke to the Voices of the West podcast about working as lead armorer for her first film before Rust. I was really nervous about it at first and I almost didn't take the job because I wasn't sure if I was ready, but doing it, like, it went really smoothly. We spent an hour and a half shooting the pistol, her giving me all her safety instructions. Did you think she was up to the job? I assumed because she was there and she was hired, she was, she was up for the job. And nothing she did raise any red flags with you? No. Okay. This, this training course you do, what did she tell you? She said things like, remember, this is, a, this is a blank round, so you have to create the discharge yourself because there's no projectile. So if you shot the gun, you go bang. When we roll the camera, you got to go bang and have the gun, gun snap back. You have to create that. She would give you little tips about firing. And she'd say to you, you know, when we're done, point the gun down. When we're done, you give the gun to me or to Halls, only those two people. Dave Halls was Rust's assistant director, also known as the first AD. Seen here in this IMDB photo, he was responsible for keeping the production on schedule. Sometimes we would be on a set that was a very, very cramped set and they wanted people in that room on an as-needed basis. If I'm holding the gun and they say cut, I then hand the gun to Halls if she's not there. Yeah, why Halls, not Hannah? Some people have said that only the armorer should be handling it. No, 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 that, that's, that's in, inaccurate, meaning in, 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 in the protocols of the business, meaning Hannah would to hand me the gun 99% of the time, no, whatever, the, the preponderance of the time. But when we would say cut, if Hannah was away from the set, I would hand Halls the gun. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed had a dual role on set, armorer, and she was also the assistant prop master for the film. 
One of the things her attorney has said is that she was hired for two positions on the film and therefore was stretched in an inappropriate way. Did she raise any of those concerns with you? No, I assume that everyone who's shooting a lower budget film uh, is stretched, myself included. And I, I, I got no complaints from her or the prop department. I'm not sitting there when I'm getting dressed and ready to go do a scene and say, oh my God, the prop woman seemed very harried today. I didn't get a sense of that from, from, from any of the, 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 the people on the film. The first time I heard that there was any problem with anybody uh, in the crew of the film was when Luber said, well, we have some issues here. Lane Looper, the first camera assistant, would email production managers a resignation letter later that night, citing safety concerns. Quote, during the filming of gunfights on this job, things are often played very fast and loose. So far, there have been two accidental weapons discharges. He also wrote about concerns about reasonable rest and housing for local crew with long commutes to the set. When he quit, now, the day before that happened, we wrapped, and he came up to me and he said, Thank you for the position you've taken on behalf of IATSE and the union on social media. I said, my pleasure. This photo, posted by Helena, showed the cast and crew in solidarity with IATSE, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, which had been on the verge of a strike. And Alec posted this on Instagram. And I want to say to the people in IATSE, do what you need to do. You want to go on strike? Go on strike. Because I'll tell you something about the executives. They don't give a about you. He said, because we have some issues here. I said, such as? And he said, my men need a better hotel room. There was no mention of safety issues. He didn't say anything about the accidental he discharges on set? He didn't say anything about anything. He goes, my men need better hotel rooms. I said, well, we're leaving, we're wrapping. Will you be here tomorrow? He said, yes. Because what I was about to do, which I've done on any number of films and TV projects was to give more of the, my salary back to the production to pay for X. And I was about to say to him, let me know what it would be to be and be you guys in a house that's closer to the, how we can address your problem. I will be happy to contribute to, to that. The next day they were gone. So you had no sense from anyone on the set that people had been stretched to the point where safety was compromised? No, no. I never heard one word about that, none. Russ producers told ABC News Mr. Looper's allegations around budget and safety are patently false, which is not surprising, considering his job was to be a camera operator and he had absolutely nothing to do with or knowledge of safety protocols or budgets. Safety is always the number one priority on our films. When people say cutting costs, I don't say this with any judgment or any cynicism. Spielberg wants to save money. Tom Cruise wants to save money. Everybody who makes movies has a responsibility not to be reckless and careless with the money that you're given. We know that those are men who make movies that cost $205 million. And I'm making movies that cost $5 million. Or the question, pounds. though, is were costs being cut at the expense of safety and security? Well, in, in, my, in my opinion, no, because I did not, now, I did not observe any safety or security issues at all in the time I was there. Thursday, October 21st, Baldwin posts a photo of himself in costume on Instagram. Back to in person at the office, blimey, it's exhausting. That morning, Looper and six other crew members walked off the set. Filming continued with a replacement camera crew. Scene 118 in the church was slated for after lunch. Everybody there was having a positive experience. People who are watching the show, people who back home, you have no idea how unique an environment a motion picture set is. It's kind of, there's an instant familiarity. The amount of care, these are people who are professionals, who have really good jobs in a field they love. And I looked at all these people and, and I see how hard they work. They're so hardworking and they're so conscientious. And you're around people, and you're part of one of the great collaborative processes in the world, movie making. Everyone moving like a watch to get everything done. And when you kind of, I, I don't make that many movies anymore. Because movie making demanded that I travel. And I didn't want to leave my family. All these movies I made, I stayed home. I didn't want to go, if I went away, I went away for a week. To leave my family for four weeks and go shoot this movie, shoot this movie, that was a big deal. 
and I'm sitting on this, this pew. And so help me God. I sat on that pew right before they called lunch and I said, this movie has made me love making movies again. Because I used to love to make movies. I did. You know, I worked with people once. I was going to do the movie The Edge. And uh, they called me and said they got Tony Hopkins to do the film. What do you make of it? Yeah, look, if we're here. And I started sobbing. I just started sobbing because I thought, oh, God, I'm going to have a chance to work with this guy. Any chance you can go easy on me? When they cast me in It's Complicated with Meryl, I thought, I'm going to get to go make a movie with her. You know, <clears throat> sorry. You know, people, they have their dreams. No matter how old you are, you have your dreams of people you want to work with. And this movie made me love making movies again. I really thought we were onto something. Next. She goes down. I thought to myself, did she faint? day of their 21 day shoot that day I did exactly what I've done every day of, uh, on that movie Baldwin was preparing for his next scene a shootout inside this wooden church set the scene right before that happened you're sitting in a pew in the church right what's the scene supposed to be the scene is the two two guys are there who have got me, uh, uh, you know, cornered, and they think I'm shot pretty bad, and I'm kind of wilting, and they are, they have a gun, and the sound outside distracts them, and I then draw the gun, uh, cross draw out of my holster, pull the gun up like that, and start to cock the pistol cut. I'm handed a gun, and someone declares, "I said this is a cold gun." Dave Halls. Oh, the, 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 the first AD. In my years on the sets of film, hot gun meant that there was a charge in there, and cold gun meant there was nothing in there. When he's saying this, this is a cold gun, what he's saying to everybody on the set is you can relax. The gun is empty. That's what cold gun means. Well, cold gun means there's no charge in there. There could be dummy rounds. A dummy round looks like a real bullet, but is completely inert. It contains no explosive charge. And you were rehearsing that scene. Was it an actual rehearsal? There's some disagreement about that, whether it was a formal rehearsal at that time. This is a marking rehearsal where I'm going to show her She's standing next to the camera. She's like this, you or me. She's got a monitor here. The camera is here filming that way. She takes a monitor that, his, that is his monitor, the operator, and turns it toward her. It swivels, and she says to me, hold the gun lower. Go to your right. Okay, right there. All right, do that. Now show it a little bit lower. And she's getting me to position the gun. Everything is in her direction. She's guiding me through how she wants me to hold the gun for this angle and I, I draw the gun out and I find a mark I draw the gun out and I find a cut and what's really urgent is the gun wasn't meant to be fired in that angle so if you're shooting directly into the camera lens you're not aiming I'm not shooting it. into the camera lens I'm shooting just off just off right in her direction I'm holding the gun where she told me to hold it which ended up being aimed right in below her armpit was what I was told I don't know this was a completely incidental shot an angle that may not have ended up in the film at all. But we kept doing this. So then I said to her, now in this scene, I'm going to cock the gun. And I said, do you want to see that? And she said, yes. So I take the gun and I start to cock the gun. I'm not going to pull the trigger. I, I said, do you see that? She goes, well, just cheat it down and tilt it down a little bit like that. And I cock the gun. I go, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? And she says, and then I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. At the moment. The that was the moment. moment the gun went off, yeah. That was the moment the gun went off. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. never. That was the training that I had. You don't point a gun at me and, and pull the trigger. On day one of my instruction in this business, people said to me, never take a gun and go click, 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 because even though it's incremental, you damage the firing pin on the gun if you do that. Don't do that. And Hall's attorney told ABC News that he was watching and agrees that Alec did not pull the trigger 
and that his finger was outside the trigger guard. So you have this Colt 45, you just pulled the hammer as far back as I could without cocking the actual And gun. you're holding onto the hammer. I'm holding that. I'm just showing. I go, how about that? Does that work? You see that? Do you see that? Is that? She goes, yeah, that's good. I let go of the hammer. Bang, the gun goes off. Well, everyone is horrified. They're shocked. Uh, it's loud. They don't have their earplugs in. No one was, the gun was supposed to be empty. I was told I was handed an empty gun. Oh, there, there were cosmetic rounds, nothing with a charge at all, a flash round, nothing. She goes down. I thought to myself, did she faint? The notion that there was a live round in that gun did not dawn on me till probably 45 minutes to an hour later. 45 minutes to an hour? Well, she's laying there and I go, did she get hit by wadding? Was there a blank, sometimes those blank rounds have a wadding inside that packs, it's like, like a cloth that packs the gunpowder in. Sometimes wadding comes out and can hit people and it can feel like a little bit of a poke. But no one could understand, did she have a heart attack? Because remember, the idea that someone put a live bullet in the gun was not even in reality. Did you go up to her? Did you back away? I went away? up to her and then we were immediately we were told to get out of the building. We were forced to get out of the building. The medics came in. I mean, I stood over her for 60 seconds and she just lay there kind of in shock. Was she conscious? Uh, my recollection is yes. 911, what's the location of your emergency? We need a net, we need an ambulance out at Bonanza Creek Ranch right now. We've had two people shot on a movie set accidentally. I'll connect you with medical dispatch. Don't need that. Director Joel Souza is also wounded. His shoulder hit by the same bullet that traveled through Helena. When she went down, he went down, and he was screaming really loudly. And I thought, well, what is he screaming? What happened? So was it loaded with a real bullet or one? Don't, I, don't, I cannot tell you that. OK. We have two injuries from a movie gun shot. OK. We're getting him out there already. Just stay on the phone with me. Thank okay. you. Within 15 minutes or 20 minutes after that, the police arrived and took the church set and put the crime tape around it, the yellow tape, and forced us all to the perimeters of the parking area where we sat and waited. She was in the church, and she was not taken out of the church for quite a while. In the aftermath, there was chaos and confusion. But nobody told you what happened? No, no. Did it, you was, know? it wasn't until I was in the police station. Hours later, I mean, it was like seeing aliens. It was, it was utter disbelief over the idea. It was unacceptable, the idea that it was a live round. And finally, one of the police officers, at the conclusion of my interview, I was there for like an hour and a half or so, she takes her phone and she slides it across to me. She says, that's what came out of Joel's shoulder, a 45 caliber slug. It was a real bullet. Had you known that Joel had been hit? No one had any idea until that police officer, that sheriff's officer, said to me, this is the slug, 45 caliber slug they took out of Joel's arm. And then the kind of insanity-inducing agony of thinking that someone put a live bullet in the gun. Tonight, breaking news. A fatal shooting on the set of Alec Baldwin's new movie in New Mexico. Something went horribly wrong here in Santa Fe. We, we've all seen that picture of you off the set in that hour or so after the gun went off. What were you doing? What was going through your mind? At the end of, she was laying there and she was there for a while. I was, I was amazed at how long they didn't get her in a car and get her out, but they waited and a helicopter came. And by the time the helicopter took off with her and I mean, literally lifted off, we were all glued to that process outside. When she finally left, I, I, I don't know how long it was. She was there, 30 minutes, 40 minutes? It, was, it seemed like a very long time. But they kept saying, well, she's stable. Like, like nobody... Just as you disbelieved that there was a live round in the gun, you disbelieved that this was going to be a fatal accident. So you didn't know exactly how serious it was? At the very end of my interview with the sheriff's department, they said to me, we regret to tell you that she didn't make it, she died. They told me right then and there. And that's when I went in the parking lot and called my wife to talk to my wife. Shock and grief. Helena's husband, Matthew, posted a tribute to Helena. Helena inspired us all with her passion and vision. 
and her legacy is too meaningful to encapsulate in words. Our loss is enormous. When this happened, her husband comes to town, her husband, Matthew. And I met with him and their son. And he was as kind as you could be. What can you possibly say to him? The, 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 I didn't know what to say. He, he hugged me and he goes, he goes I, I suppose you and I are going to go through this together, he said. And I thought, well, not as much as you are, you know, and his little boy is there who's nine years old. I have, I have six kids now. I have my older daughter, Ireland, but of the six kids that he Laurie and I have, my oldest is eight. I have a nine-month-old baby. And I think to myself, this little boy um, doesn't have a mother anymore. And I know that in my life, I'm with my kids, and I'm doing quite well with my kids. My kids and I are having a great time, right until my wife walks in the room, and then I become invisible. My kids all go, and they uh, uh, jump on top of their mother. And this boy doesn't have a mother anymore. And, um, and there's nothing we can do to bring her back. And I told him, I said, I, 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 I don't know what to say. I don't know how to convey to you how sorry I am and how I'm willing to do anything I can to cooperate. In the aftermath of the shooting, a torrent of criticism. The first thing you do when you pick up that gun is you make sure uh, that it's never pointed at anybody. He, he should have known that an AD handing you a gun and saying it's cold isn't the same as several people showing you an empty gun. If I were holding that gun, I would have checked it, wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. People said to me, I mean, I, I got countless people online saying, you, you idiot, you never point a gun at someone. Well, unless you're told it's empty and it's the director of photography who's instructing you on, on the angle for a shot we're going to do. And she and I had this thing in common where we both thought it was empty and it wasn't. And that's not her responsibility. That's not my responsibility. Whose responsibility is remains to be seen. But I do, well, there but are I, some who say you're never supposed to point a gun at anyone on a set, no matter what. Unless the person is the cinematographer who's directing me at where to point the gun for her camera angle. That's exactly what happened. That day, I did exactly what I've done every day of, uh, on that movie. Which is what? Which is that there's an armorer there, and, and that word is new to me. In the years I've been in this What business, did you call it? It was a prop guy or woman. And the prop person would come, and sometimes they would insist on demonstrating for you and the camera crew. they take the gun. If it was a contemporary gun, they'd show you the chamber. They'd show you the clip. They'd say, the gun is cold. And you look and go, thank you. And in the 40 years... Sometimes that would happen. Not all the time. Well, but no, no, sometimes they wouldn't demonstrate to me. Some insisted on demonstrating. They would do the demonstration for everybody there right before we rolled the camera or rehearsed. Then there were others who they didn't do that because I trusted them to do the job. And again, this is not just me pointing a gun at somebody else, people pointing guns at me. Well, I, I've gotten shot and killed in films before where people had to shoot a flash round at me. And I trusted them to do their job. And in the 40 years I've been in this business, all the way up until that day, I never had a problem. How many times do you think you handled a gun in those 40 years? Oh, God, I don't know. I don't know. What, what amazes me is how many bullets, how many rounds of bullets do you believe have been fired on the sets of movies and TV shows in the last 75 years? No idea. Right. It couldn't even be, be above a billion. You've had hundreds and hundreds of millions of bullets fired on the sets of films and TV shows, and four or five people were killed. Now, those deaths are, are, are tragic and abhorrent. And believe me, I would do anything in my power. I would do anything in my power to undo what was done. Now, I don't know how that bullet arrived in that gun. I don't know. But I I'm all for doing anything that will take us to a place where we're, it's, this is less likely to happen again. Every single time I'm handed a gun on a set, every time, Mark, they hand me a gun, I look at it, I open it, I show it to the person I'm pointing it to, we show it to the crew. Every yeah. single take, you hand it back to the armor when you're done, you do it again. Right. Everyone does it. Everybody knows it.
How do you respond to actors like George Clooney who say that every time they were handed a gun, they checked it themselves? Well, there were a lot of people who felt it necessary to contribute some comment to the situation, which really didn't help the situation at all. You have your, if, if your protocol is you checking the gun every time, well, good for you, good for you. You know, I mean, I probably handled weapons as much as any other actor in films with, with an average career. Again, shooting or being shot by someone. And in, in, in that time, I had a protocol, and it never let me down. Why did you choose in your 40 years not to check the gun yourself? What I was taught by someone years ago was, as I said, if I, if I took a gun and I popped a clip out of a gun or I manipulated the chamber of a gun, they would take the gun away from me and redo it. The prop person said, don't do that, when I was young. And they'd say, one thing you need to understand is we don't want the actor to be the last line of defense against a catastrophic breach of safety with the gun. My job, they told me, man or woman, my job is to make sure the gun is safe and then I hand you the gun and I declare the gun safe. The crew's not relying on you to say that it's safe. They're relying on me to say that it's safe. When that person who was charged with that job handed me the weapon, I trusted them and, and I never had a problem. And never. this was from the beginning of your career? From, from day one. There's one person that's supposed to make sure that what is in the gun is right and that it's, what's wrong is not in the gun. One person has that responsibility to maintain the gun. And what is the actor's responsibility? I, I guess that's a, that's a tough question because the actor's responsibility going this day forward is very different than it was the day before that. Yeah, now, now I can't. First of all, I can't imagine I'd ever do a movie that had a gun in it again. And um, I can't. When you say what is the actor's responsibility, the actor's responsibility is to do what the prop armorer tells him to do. And we did not have a problem. I mean, I understand there was an accidental discharge at one point on the set of a blank round, but we did not have a problem for me until that day. Everything gets slowed down. It's a pruder film-esque here. And the issue with that is, is there's only one question to be resolved, only one. And that is, where did the live round come from? The particulars of what happened, the particulars, most importantly, of how a, a piece of live ammunition ended up on this property. It wasn't supposed to be on the property. It wasn't supposed to be on the truck. It wasn't supposed to be in the kit. It wasn't supposed to be in somebody's fanny pack. A live round is not supposed to be anywhere near the set. How did a real bullet get on I that set? That, that, what I'm saying is that's for a criminal investigation to solve. I have no idea. I have no idea. I take that back, I have some ideas, but that's not for me to say. I've spoken to the sheriff's department multiple times. I don't have anything to hide, you know what I mean? The facts as I see them are what I've stated on the record. You're not worried about being charged. I don't, I've been told by people who are in the know in terms of even inside the state that it's highly unlikely I would be charged with anything criminally. In the aftermath of the shooting, authorities are investigating how live rounds made it onto the New Mexico set. Earlier this week, a search warrant was executed at an Albuquerque prop house owned by Seth Kenny, who told detectives he was hired to supply Russ with guns, as well as dummy rounds and blanks. PDQ Arm and Prop supplied the guns, the blank ammunition, and 50 dummy rounds to the show. Kenny, who asked for his face not to be shown, says he wasn't the film's only provider. It's not a possibility that they came from PDQ or from myself personally. When we send dummy rounds out, they get individually rattle tested before they get sent out. So if you have a box of 50, you've got to do it 50 times. And then at that point, you know they're safe to send. Baldwin says he placed his trust in Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. According to that search warrant, the young armorer told investigators she loaded five dummy rounds into Baldwin's gun before lunch and a sixth after, when the gun was retrieved from a safe. Gutierrez Reed's attorney has said she has no idea where the live rounds came from. He raised the possibility that someone may have deliberately mixed live rounds in a box of dummies in an act of sabotage. First of all, you wouldn't bring a live round on the set. But second of all, why do you place that in the box labeled dummies that the armor is going to be pulling from? Everybody knows they're going to be getting them from there. Why would you do that other than to try to cause some incident on the set? Her attorney has said he believes the set was sabotaged. Do you believe the set was sabotaged? 
Well, I didn't believe that Helena was shot and found out that she was shot with a live bullet. So there are things that I never imagined could happen, which turned out to have happened. Do I believe that the set was sabotaged? Uh, no, because I can't imagine how that would have been affected. I don't, I don't know how somebody would have done that. I mean, in a world I was told in which one person loaded a gun, then another person picked up the gun to bring me the gun. Whatever happened in that preceding us rehearsing and her being killed, whatever happened there, I don't know. But when he made those claims, I thought, that's, that's a big swing. That's, a, that's an enormous charge to make that someone came and did something for what purpose? To attack who? To discredit who? To harm me, the production? I mean, that, that means motive and opportunity. You know, what, what was their motive in doing that if somebody did that? It's overwhelmingly likely that it was an accident, you know? The Santa Fe District Attorney leading the investigation has said she does not believe sabotage is a possibility. I know that some defense attorneys have come up with conspiracy theories and have used the, the, words, the word sabotage. We do not have any proof. According to a search warrant, Assistant Director David Halls, seen in this IMDB photo, told investigators Gutierrez Reed opened the firearm used by Baldwin, but Halls could only remember seeing three rounds and that he should have checked all of them but didn't and couldn't recall if Gutierrez Reed spun the drum. Pauls also told investigators he didn't know there were any live rounds in the firearm. But his attorney has said it wasn't Hall's responsibility to confirm whether the gun was loaded. Let me just say something else also, by the way, which I think is important, which is that I don't want to see anybody suffer unnecessarily. I feel terrible what's happened to Hannah. I do. I feel horrible what happened to Hall's. I do. I mean, I mean, this is something where, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, someone put... We're, the, the, the investigation's going to find out, but someone put a live bullet in a gun, a bullet that wasn't even supposed to be on the property. And this is the thing I hope that the sheriff's department doesn't give up on, that they follow this to the ends of the earth. Where did that bullet come from? Somebody brought live rounds, plural, onto the set of the film, and one of them ended up in that gun. And if the, and if the bullets didn't come on the property, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Now, at the same time, I don't want to see Hannah suffer and Hall suffer and all these people suffer the agony of having to face what they're responsible for, what they did. It makes me sick because, you know, I myself, I mean, I, I, I'm married, I got six kids, I want to just live my life in peace. And I've had all these people say, you know, say you're a murderer and you didn't do this and you didn't do that. Um, it's been very tough. One of your brothers, Daniel, suggested that you've also become a target for your political abuse. Do you agree with that? Well, I don't, I don't think that anybody has said anything about and has, has used this as an opportunity other than people you would fully expect to have done that. Like President Trump? The former president of the United States said that, that I'm a wacko or whatever, and I probably shot her and killed her on purpose. Or loaded the gun. He said that I did it deliberately. He said he killed her deliberately. And I thought to myself, just when you think that the, the thing is can't get more surreal, here is the former president of the United States making a comment on this tragic situation, which also brings me to two civil suits that were filed, which I find odd because those two people are lunging toward making sure their suits are filed before the husband files his suit. They couldn't wait until Matthew, on behalf of his son, filed his suit So first. you expect Matthew to file a suit? Oh, but how could it be otherwise? His wife was killed as a result of someone's, uh, I mean, I don't want to say negligence. It's not for me to use that word. That's a legal term. But, you know, something happened here that resulted in his wife's death. He's entitled to something as far as I'm concerned. I would be stunned if Matthew, on behalf of his son, did not file some kind of civil suit against the production with its insurers and so forth like that but likely to name you as well, a producer well i think that all the producers will be named it remains to be seen which producers have the responsibility for hiring the people involved and you're convinced matthew doesn't blame you in any way for helena's death i, I can't speak for matthew i can't i can't when I, when I met with him he was there we went to dinner with his son we went to the memorial service together uh, the crew had a little memorial service for her before we left, which was very beautiful and very simple. And uh, I've communicated with him a couple times since then, but I do believe he's 
uh, gone off in a direction where he's not going to communicate with people at the advice of his lawyer right now. I tried to save him his whole life. Serge Spetnoy, the film's chief of lighting, filed the first civil lawsuit against the production company and the crew members who officials say handled the gun, including Alec Baldwin. He alleged they failed to implement appropriate safety standards and measures on the Rust movie production. The second civil suit from script supervisor Mamie Mitchell also alleged there were warning signs of the dangerous conditions that existed on set. The attorneys for one of the first script supervisor, Mamie Mitchell, who filed one of the suits, said Mr. Baldwin chose to play Russian roulette when he fired a gun without checking it and without having the armor do so in his presence. His behavior and that of the producers on Rust was reckless. How do you respond? There are two people that filed civil suits so far. And one of them walked up to me outside the church, probably within 15 or 20 minutes of the event itself, and put their hand on me and said, you realize that you have no responsibility for what's happened here, don't you? Was this Serge? No comment. One of those two. And now that person is suing me. Now, again, they're entitled to change their mind. More importantly, they're entitled to sit down with a lawyer who will convince them to change their mind. A Serge, for example, and this is the only thing I'll say about someone specifically, he was her dear friend. He was a very close friend of hers. And yet he's chosen to file his lawsuit in advance of Matthew's suit. Which and there's only so much money. Well, if you get into settlements alone, there's a pool of the insurance money, there's a couple different policies, there's a pool of money that's available that is finite. Now, you could access more money somehow if you sue people individually and find them individually responsible. I just found the filing of the two lawsuits, civil lawsuits, in advance of Matthew filing his lawsuit, I found that to be um, unsettling. Sarah Svetnay told ABC News that he did tell Baldwin what happened that day wasn't his fault, but now believes differently, and that the actor should have checked the gun. When we come back... You felt shock. You felt anger. You felt sadness. Do you feel guilt? In the month and a half since Helena Hutchins' tragic death on the set of Rust, Alec Baldwin says his life has become a recurring nightmare. I'm not somebody who has a lot of vivid dreams, but I have dreams about this constantly now. I wake up constantly where, where guns are going off. These images have come into my mind and kept me awake at night, and I haven't slept for weeks, and I've really been struggling physically. I'm exhausted uh, from this because I gotta try to be there for my kids. And my family's all I have. I mean, I, I, honest to God, I couldn't give a about my career anymore. Is it over? Why? Well, it could be. It could be. If I decide that I, I mean, could I work? I'm going to go make another movie in January. And I said to them, do you want to get out of it? Do you want to get rid of me because of what happened? They said no. But I said to myself, do I want to work much more after this? Is it worth it? For now, Baldwin is spending much of his time focused on his family, trying to stay out of the public eye. My kids are in the car crying. I'm just asking. We sat down as a courtesy now to talk to you. Now, please, would you just not follow us for the rest? Just, just leave us alone. Just go home. We gave go you home. everything we could Thank possibly you. give you, okay? Thank you, All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alec. You mentioned your kids. Have you been able to talk to them about this, or are they too young? I had to tell my two older kids what happened. Yeah, my wife and I told them what happened. Because they're going to go to school. And it's less about what kids say at school than what the parents say at school. I live in New York. I always loved living in New York because it was like you were one of many people and, uh, you know, nobody gives a who you are, really, until this happens. And then you're walking down the street, you see a lot of this. Someone hit somebody. They're like, oh, there he is. You see a lot of this with people in a coffee shop with their phone. Go like this. You see a lot of people behaving a certain way. How do you not internalize that? Oh, I do. I do. It just has made me sick. But again, I don't want to sound like I'm a victim. I mean, again, we have two clear victims here. Is this the worst thing that's ever happened to you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, I think back and I think of what could I have done. Your emotions are so clearly so right there on the surface. You felt shock. You felt anger. You felt sadness. Do you feel guilt? No, no. 
I feel that there is, I, I feel that, that, that uh, someone is responsible for what happened, and I can't say who that is, but I know it's not me. I mean, I, I, honest to God, if I felt that I was responsible, I might have killed myself if I thought I was responsible. And I don't say that lightly. Baldwin now awaiting the outcome of the sheriff's investigation, hoping whatever it uncovers helps to ensure a tragedy like this never happens again. What do we come out of this learning? What do we come out of it? What changes can be made? Because where you have a person where, where, as I said, this is one in a billion, that someone puts a real bullet in the gun. That never happens. And the idea that a real bullet was in that gun and would come out of that gun and kill that woman, that, that was not even in the realm of possibility. And that's the thing that they must find out, is where, who brought bullets onto the set? She's a wonderful mom and a wonderful wife and was a, just a wonderful soul. Is there anything that you'd like everyone to know about Helena? Well, I work with some of the greatest cinematographers. And she was the loveliest woman, one of the loveliest women I've ever worked with. And one of the most professional in terms of her demeanor. After she died, all these statements are made by her friends and things about her, how loved she was and is. I would have been lucky to have ever done another movie with another person like that or with her. And, and I don't get to. I think it's important to remember that she was as admired as she was loved. That's, that's essential to say that is that she's someone who people really, really thought she had a great talent.